Ah, uh, there you are now. I thought you were lost. Do you know, it's a good job that this isn't one of them fancy deck chairs I'm sitting in, where you have to pay 10 pence or 20p an hour, or I'd owe the green a fortune. Well, here we are, Stephen's green. I suppose you want me to show you around. Well, whenever you're ready. Well, here I am now, standing on O'Connell Bridge in Stevens Green, Dublin. Dublin has the distinction of having two of many things. It has two cathedrals, it has two universities, it has two canals, the Grand and the Royal, and it has two O'Connell Bridges, and this is one of them. Now, 350 years ago, this was Ellen Hoare's meadow. In fact, it was neither one thing nor the other. It was neither in the city, nor it was neither in the liberties. I suppose that's why the corporation gave it to a woman. Ellen Hoare had a very good business mind. She set it all out in plots, let it out, and reserved a certain portion of the green for a park. Now, anyone that bought a plot around the green was supposed to plant six sycamore trees. But you the jibbles living around the green planted nothing. It wasn't until the 18th century when the lordly and stately mansions began to go up around the green. In 1815, they put a railings all around it. And you had to live in the lordly mansions before you got a key to the gate. Oh, no poor or working class could come into this green. It was only for the gentry. No working class people would be allowed in whatsoever. But there's a man over there that changed all that. Mr. Arthur Guinness, Lord Ardalon himself, who were of the goodness of his heart, threw open Stephen's green for the poor people of Dublin. Ivy House, the one-time home of another Guinness, Sir Benjamin Lee Guinness, who will always be remembered in Ireland as the man who restored St. Patrick's Cathedral in the Liberties. So the Green is a university. It's an open university. It's teeming with historical information and beauty. And all those young people you see studying today they're all the lawyers, the doctors, the barristers, and the professors of tomorrow. Stephen's Green is suitable for anything. It's a lovely place to relax among the flowers and the birds and the breeze and the trees and the shrubs and the ducks and the drakes. Feeding the ducks in the green is a great pastime. So my mother used to bring me when I was a toddler myself in to throw the crumbs and the crust to the ducks. And I remember one evening coming home from work and I had a bit of lunch over in my pocket and I decided I'd go up and feed the ducks in the green. 
Now, I opened up the bag. I went to put my fingers in to take out a bit of bread. Wasn't there a lovely lump of crust with a hole in it, you know, where the butter jammed in? And I'm taking it out, and I was a bit hungry, and I said, I think I'll have that bit for myself. And as I was about to put it into my mouth, didn't a duck grab me by the leg? I suppose your man was saying, this fella, after coming up here to feed us, and he's eating it himself. So remember, if you think you're putting your little bit of bread into your own mouth while you're up there, make sure there isn't a duck at your feet. The green is a great place for people. But sure, of course, people were always associated with the green. It's from Stephen's Green that the Dublin St. Patrick's Day Parade leaves off. And it was here that the Lord Mayor and the 25 corporations and trade guilds used to set off for riding the fringes and fixing the boundaries in Dublin many, many years ago. I suppose the 25 corporations and trades are well represented here today. So you'd have all the guilds represented. If you were to ask the people what walk of life they fitted into today, should any one of them could hoist the old trade banner that used to be hoisted here in Stephen's Green. And I suppose the coopers and the brewers are well represented. They'd be represented by all the fellas waiting here for the pubs to open or for the holy hour to pass by. And of course, Lord Ardalan himself, the chief brewer, looking down on us all. Well, Paddy, what do you think of Stephen's Green? Oh, I think it's the most wonderful park in the city of Dublin. All the characters that was ever born passed this way. But if they didn't, they don't know what they're missing. But you were born in Bagus Street. Did you come here as a child? I did, of course. It was the only natural place we had to come to. Bar Merrion Square, but the Merrion Square was locked up at that time. But this was an open for every individual around the area. This was the park. Well, Paddy, I suppose you remember all the old characters that came through Stephen's Green. Andy Main, the board, Flanagan, Perry, Yank, Curry, Lemon, Shell Shop, Jones, a whole lot of them. Well, I wish they were alive. <laughs> At the present time, we could have a little bit of fun and a little bit of laugh with them. Sure. Because that's what it was all about. That's what life is all about. And that's the way they made it. They made life what it's all about. So you could tell the history of Ireland by walking around the green. Aye, and a bit of the history of England and a little bit of the history of Germany. To go around there and look at all the landmarks and memorials, the Boer War, the Great War, the Second World War and the German memorial that the German people gave to the people of Dublin for Save the German Children campaign. See, of the whole lot. Well, if you call it a shooting gallery, you're right. <laughs> but it is it. It and is. And there's no doubt in the world about it. If anybody wants to enjoy themselves, get into good company. Intelligent company. This is the place to come. Yeah, Stephen's Green. He shall not hear the bittern cry in the wild skies where he is lain, nor voices of the sweeter birds above the wailing of the rain, nor shall he know when loud March blows, those slanting snows her fanfare shrill, blown to flame the golden cup of many an upset daffodil. 
But when the dark cow leaves the moor and pastures poor with greedy weeds, perhaps he'll hear our low at morn lifting our horns in pleasant meads. The lines of Francis Ledwidge's poem written in the trenches about Thomas McDonough. The Countess Margaret, second in command of the Irish Citizen Army, led our men here into the green, but the British Army brought their machine guns up onto the roof of the Shelbourne Hotel and forced them back into the College of Surgeons. The College of Surgeons was erected on a site of ground donated by the Quakers. They say if you're here at midnight, you can see the ghosts of the second up buyers coming up York Street to sell the bodies to the doctors in the College of Surgeons. Bold Robert Demet, the darling of Erden, hanged and beheaded in Thomas Street, Dublin. He was born across the road in 124 St. Stephen's Green. You know, you'd nearly write a book on every house in Stephen's Green, from the DBC where Pierce and McDonough had their scones, up to the Stephen's Green Club, and on to where Francis Ball had our Loretta Convent and Mary Aikenhead had our Vincent's Hospital. Number 22 was the headquarters of the Friendly Brothers of St. Patrick, an anti-dueling society. Many's the ladies' hat box I delivered to the Dublin University Club from the fashionable store in Grafton Street. The club was originally Milltown House. It was owned by the Leeson family, who gave their name to Milltown and Leeson Street. I like to walk along the bow walk of Stephen's Green, because at one time it was only the gentry that were allowed to walk here. It was here where they had, as Dean Swift said, the finest gravel in Europe. When we were kids, we used to play beds here. You know, you wouldn't need any chalk. Of course, beds was the girls' game. But the boys used to play them as well. Not with the girls, of course, but by themselves. The old fountain in Stephen's Green, given to the corporation by Lady Laura Grattan, uh, many of the buckets of water we drank here. There used to be a lovely spout coming out of there and all lovely cups chained on here. Of course, the horses and the ginnets and the mules and the asses all come into this lot. But dogs never drank out of that. The old dogs used to drunk, jump up here and drink out of this. It was not a lovely piece of work there. And you know, for all the thirst that was quenched here at this fountain, whoever gave a thought to the good woman, Lady Laura Grattan. Not a one, I suppose, but we'll think of her this morning. But you know what it is? Walking along here in the bow walk, it does something, I don't know what it is, but the sun and the trees, and it has a certain beauty about it that you'll find bad to beat anywhere else in the world. My mother used to play here. In fact, this was our front garden and our back garden from our tenement rooms in Pitt Street. There was no fancy trains or merry-go-rounds in those days, as these two nice old ladies could tell you. Everyone that came to Dublin of note went back home and wrote an old book on it. 
Now we have books by Germans and Chinamen and Frenchmen and Englishmen. Well, this gentleman, W.M. Thackeray, Irish sketchbook, and he sent a copy to Charles Lever of Temple Oak House near Dublin. Now, he came to Dublin on a visit, Thackeray, and he stayed over here in the Shelbourne Hotel. And this is what he had to say about the Shelbourne. The hotel is a respectable old edifice, much frequented by families from the country, where the solitary traveller may likewise find society, for he may use the Shelbourne as a hotel or as a boarding house, in which latter case he is comfortably accommodated at a very moderate charge of six and eightpence. Just imagine a day in the Shelburne for six and eightpence. Now, one day he was coming out the door of the Shelburne, and one of the Dublin women were passing by, calling out Dublin Bay Hedens. And as she passed out, he said, Oh, Dublin Bay Hedens, I seized the earliest opportunity, and I ordered a boiled one for me breakfast. Newman House, where James Joyce wrote his first story, Stephen Hero. And up the steps too, Padraig Pierce came for these lessons. It was one time the home of Richard Chapel Whaley, the father of Book Whaley, the man that walked to Jerusalem on back and won a bet of 15,000 pounds. Well, Whaley's son, John, now he was a real man about town in the 18th century. He drank down in Daly's club house in College Green and attended many the midnight party in the Hellfire Club. They say that he took oyster suppers in Queen Casey's cellars in Britain Street. Now he said to have jumped from the top window, actually from the back of the line there, onto the carriages passing by. Now can you imagine a poor old Jarvey coming along here with a few jars on him and half asleep and he dodded along, letting the horse find its own way back to the stable. When next, out of the window, comes the Buck Whaley landing in the back of his cab. So Buck Whaley will be always remembered for his oyster suppers and his cockle parties and his jumping out of the window in Stephen's Green. Isn't it a disgrace the way they're pulling down good sound houses in Stephen's Green so that they can put up new office blocks for speculators? Ah, oh, Janie, the old house is vacant. Do you know, if I had a few shillings, I'd nearly buy or rent this old house. This is one of the finest houses in Stephen's Green. In fact, it's one of the finest houses in Dublin. This house was built in 1765 for a man by the name Augustavus Hume, the fellow that gave his name to Hume Street. Hume sold this house to the Protestant Archbishop of Dublin. And the first man through that door was his lordship, Lord George Beresford, the man that gave many gifts to Trinity College. He was succeeded by Dr. William McGee. Now, Dr. William was a little man like myself, but he rode around the green on one of the biggest horses in Dublin. It'd be nice to have a big horse to ride around the green, wouldn't it? Now, he was succeeded by another man by the name of Richard Whiteley. Now, Richard was a bit odd, but he was a very kind bishop to the poor of Dublin. After dinner every day, He'd come out the hall door. He'd look up the green, across the green, and down the green. He'd give his bishop's robes a bit of a shake. And then he'd come down one, two, three, four, five steps. He'd pull up his bishop's cloak or his robes, and he'd sit down on the steps. Take out his pipe and light up. And then, to the horror of all the gentry who are going by in their fashionable carriages and horses, 
he'd say, Hello, Stafford, how are you? How is Molly Stafford? Hello, Gainsford, how is the old gout? I hope it's better. Uh, hello, Carmichael, I'll be up for tea tomorrow night. And the gentry were really running around the green with their collars up or going around the other way to avoid them. Now, when he got fed up sitting here, and possibly when the old pipe went out, he went across the Stevens Green and he played tip and take and hide and seek with his three mongrel dogs. Well, you look at all these. I don't know how that got in there, or this bit. But they say these as, as lordships, weeds. I wonder what class of a weed that is. I must ask that for Bellamy the next time he comes to Dublin about these Dublin weeds. Because do you know what? We have millions of them. My mother used to grow them in a garden. No weeds there. This is where they keep all the nice hothouse plants. And of course they're attended on water daily. The two men here are Christie and Paddy Waters, who have spent a lifetime tending the flowers in Stevens Green. They're part of the background boys, as you call them, the gardeners and all the people with the nice green fingers who are working in the early hours of the morning after the park closes up to keep the park looking its best for you, giving it its haircut and shave and shampoo and manicure and seeing that it's in the best of fashion and that the colours of every flower are brought out to their fullest. Whenever I see nice flowers like this, I'm always reminded of the story of a lady who was planting flower seeds in our back garden. And our little boy, about three year old, was by our side. And he picked up the packet of seeds and he was looking at the seeds. And in the middle of looking at the seeds, he says, Mummy, Mummy, where did I come from, Mummy? So the poor woman, uh, she didn't know what answer she was going to give him. So she looked at him and she saw him with the packet of seeds in her hand. And she, she that's where you came from. You came from a packet of seeds like that. So the little fella looked at the packet of flower seeds and he, then he says, Mammy, Mammy, was there a picture of me in the packet, Mammy? Gardine the Dowell. Garden of the Blind. You know, I often like to sit here. And sometimes I sit up straight, erect, like a blind man, and close my eyes, and try to wonder what the blind man or the blind woman sees in their mind's eye, the magic sounds they hear, and what Stephen Green looks to to them. But you know, there's a certain peace and a certain happiness in this corner of the green that will not be found in any other place.
the lakes in Stevens Green, of course, are artificial lakes. That's the tragedy about Dublin. We've no lakes. Ah, well, it's time to drum up with a bit of grub. And I suppose have a bit of a sleep after it. Well, at one time there was water in these fountains, but it was switched off during the war. So one of them wouldn't switch it back on again. I know now where Jackie Carey learned how to head a football, but it was here in Stevens Green he played before going across the water to play for England and captain their teams to many a cup victory. Do you know what I'm going to tell you? Noel Purcell is a very wise man when he sings. Dublin can be heaven with coffee at 11 and a stroll in Stevens Green no need to worry, no need to hurry. You're a king and the lady's a queen. <laughs>